Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the village of Franklin. Both our TV channels, Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. You can also view us online, civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link or join us on the small player at the top right of our homepage. Also on lakesfm.com, live streaming uh, the radio version of today's program. On Facebook, facebook.com slash civiccentertv and facebook.com slash lakesfm. We will return to 88.1 The Biff tomorrow. Today they are doing their annual Radio Fund broadcast and you can uh, please support them as this is their annual fundraiser over there. Joining me also from the city of Kiko Harbor as always is Ronnie Dahl. Hello, Mr. Tyler. I hope you got outside yesterday to enjoy the weather. It was amazing. Yeah, we had some quick meet. We had a quick meeting last night, so I was able to get out for a little bit after uh, around uh, 6:30, 7 o'clock last night, and enjoy a little bit of the sun. Go for a little walk after I got home last night, and soak a little bit of it in as the day came to an end. But a very nice day yesterday, and looks like we're off to a good start today. I know it's it's still crazy to me that uh, it's going to be 90 by the weekend, but I will say um, it's so nice. Like, don't you just feel like this year is so much different than even last year? Because this year now we have the vaccine, the weather's turning nicer. We have the um, easing of restrictions on the mask, just even if it's confusing, but it just kind of feels different, doesn't it? Yeah, all these things are kind of happening at the same time and, and sort of progressing at the same rate all together. And so it, it kind of is like a, a sort of rebirth of our society here as we're slowly coming out of the pandemic, slowly getting into the warmer and more fun seasons of the year here in the state of Michigan. And I think that's all together going to have a big impact as we do come out of this pandemic and people do readjust, maybe making things a little bit easier than they would have been, say, if we were coming out of the pandemic you know, at the tail end of fall, going into the grayness and the depressing nature of, of winter. <laughs> that's a good, <laughs> that is true. Although I will say that uh, any season you come out of a pandemic is a good season. Very, um, very true. <laughs> hey, so it was so exciting though. Um, one of the best things about living here in our community is really the mother nature behind us. So um, took uh, Trixie Dixie the Wonder Dog out for her morning walk today. And usually when we see deer, which is a pretty regular basis uh, now, um, she just sits, watches them like, hi, how are you? But this morning she decides like, no, I think I want to chase them. But they were like, they come so close to us now. They're not afraid. And it's just, uh, it's such a crazy thing to um, get so close uh, to some of the deer that are here in our neighborhoods and on at the trail. And then it, it, we get past the deer um, and then there's a bunny sitting within just a few feet of us, just munching the grass. But Trixie doesn't even look at that. I'm like, I don't get it. I just don't get this dog. Yeah, and plus like, the bunnies are a little more easily startled and will run around. If anything, that's going to be more more of a pursuit for, for Trixie and would be a lot more fun than a deer that's standing there like, yeah, I don't really care. I'm just sitting here, you know, grazing on grass. You want to bark at me? I'm just going to go to another spot. And there's no reaction there. But a, a bunny that's more boisterous and energetic and running around everywhere, no reaction at all from, from Trixie. Interesting character, definitely. It is, it, but she does have a human attached to the it's end true. of the leash, so is true. she's not going too far. But I will say one of the good things is I uh, noticed yesterday, like my flowers for Mother's Day, they were uh, dying and I forgot to go and pick up flowers. So for anyone that lives here in the neighborhood, which is pretty much everyone, um, there is a place right there on Cass Lake Road. Um, it's next door to the Indigo restaurant i think it's in indigo it's right? in, yeah the endo 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 restaurant um it's next door to them it's a liquor store okay uh but what they do is they sell fresh flowers and i think it's a neighbor around the corner that provides them and it's on an honor system so you can go and get these little bouquets they're like three bucks and they're like it's an honor system you just put your cash in the little box they have there and you can go in and get all the fresh flowers uh that you want and I love it because I, I feel like I'm really supporting 
local, anyone who's on the honor system, by the way, you're getting more money. <laughs> I, I would hope. I, I would hope most people are paying more just for the fact that uh, people are like that. But I intended to go out last night and then didn't get around to it. So I was like, oh, my flowers are dead. What am I going to do? Well, when you're walking on the trail right now, there are all these like flowers blooming on the trail. So I'm like, mm -hmm. eh, I'll just pick the weeds. <laughs> They're weeds, but they look good. They fill a spot because I always need something to fill that spot. So they fill a spot. Yeah, they look good. They look they look good there, and you know, not and a lot of the weeds that that are growing on the side of the uh, of the trails or on or in people's yards. You know, some some of them they just you know they don't like them there because they don't want them there. They intend to plant them there, but they still have some beauty. And you know, you put them in a spot like like you have there, it works in that background. I think it looks good. It's a good decision. <laughs> so Tyler, I saw this app for everyone out there that does not have a green thumb. This time of year can kind of be confusing because you're like when stuff starts to pop up in your yard, you're like, is it a plant or is it a weed? Right. There is an app now that you can uh, use, take a picture, uh, and then it will say weed, <laughs> flower. <laughs> um, because that's, I, I know that sounds crazy. Like really, you're like, how could you not know a weed? But uh, it's, it, it's happening quite often, especially in our backyard. Yeah, and especially when we have all these uh, in invasive species that are coming in too, that are that are weeds that are growing around everywhere, and they start spreading through. And each season, you know, the weeds that you do have in your yard end up having end up multiplying and, and to some extent, and you're just confused. You're like, okay, I see some new flowers popping up, and these, and these maybe that these are native flowers, or maybe these are weeds. Some other plants are pop are popping up too, and maybe they're right around all your other other plants and you're just trying to to manage well i don't want to take a native plant out of the out of the ground if it's not doing anything harmful and just being there but a weed that that's going to be you know taking water and taking other resources from the soil away from my other plants yeah i want to get that out of there i don't know what it is and, and a lot of people don't have general horticulture knowledge to know that one thing is a weed versus a flower so those apps are helpful there's an app for everything ronnie my husband did say yesterday he's like hey can you get like a tree doctor on your show? Because I need to figure out why our junipers are dying. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll look into that. Uh, but I will say the one thing that uh, I do not welcome in the springtime. So we have this little um, pond. It's like, it, it's just one of those little tiny backyard ponds that you can put in. Okay. I think uh, last year I bought it off of Craigslist. This guy was renovating um, houses in Detroit and it was in the backyard. So I was like, oh, I'll go to Detroit for 20 bucks. It was 20 bucks. Yeah. If I bought it online, it was a few hundred. And um, so we put it in, even got this little turtle thing that spits the water, keeps it going, all of that stuff. So um, uh, it just kind of fill this, our backyard spot. It's nice, but it's been covered all winter. So yesterday, my husband's golfing. I said, well, let me go ahead and take, you know, the covering off and clean it up and, and get it ready to go this year. Oh my God, Tyler. I think I saw four or five snakes. Oh. <laughs> and I was screaming. Uh -oh. oh, and and Trixie, by the way, our um dog, our cocker spaniel that we had that passed away, she used to hunt for golf balls. Great. Great to have a dog that hunts for golf balls. By the way, we have hundreds if anyone <laughs> needs some. Uh Trixie likes to hunt for snakes. Oh. And so she was going crazy because when I took the tarp off and then try to clean out all these snakes. It, well, it, all four snakes, but it seemed like a lot to me. And I get their little tiny garden snakes, but I still don't like snakes. Snakes are snakes. <laughs> right? So uh, I'm not sure where they went, but hopefully they did not stay in our yard. Yeah, that, that tends to happen, happen with those ponds. I know my uh, stepdad um, at, at his and my mom's old place, he had, built, he had built a pond in the front yard. He had also done that with, uh, help, helped our, neighbors across the street do that the same a few years before that and, and it was regular when they were cleaning the, that out and preparing it for the warmer seasons that they find snakes or other little critters in there roaming around but yeah hopefully Trixie's not you know finding too many of them or at the very least if she if she is she's chasing them away and not saying hey and I'm you know, bringing them over to you and being like hey mom look what I found it's a snake oh it's still alive take it in your hands <laughs> I do have a one of my friends I think her cat always brings in like random animals yeah. <laughs> you know yeah we don't want that yeah. uh hey uh, so you know tyler over the past week uh, so much focus has been on the cd changes to the mask mandate mm -hmm. i don't think people really realize 
that uh, the CDC has also eased the COVID-19 testing recommendations uh, for vaccinated uh, people. So uh, not only can vaccinated people mostly avoid masks, they can also limit testing for COVID-19. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention this week said uh, vaccinated people without symptoms mostly don't need to get tested, even if exposed to the virus. So people who are fully vaccinated don't have symptoms also should not be randomly screened according to the CDC. So uh, of course the CDC's loosening of the masking restrictions and updated testing guidance comes as large private employers and universities still routinely test vaccinated employees as well as students. People uh, still can become infected with COVID-19 after getting vaccinated, we know that, but they are much less likely to get sick and also less likely to pass the virus to others. Experts say the agency's updated testing recommendations are consistent with past guidance and are designed to avoid unnecessary testing and disruptions. A couple exceptions though, CDC still recommending people who show symptoms of COVID-19 to get tested. Also vaccinated people without symptoms to get tested if they are in a prison or a homeless shelter. And uh, we also know the healthcare workers and residents of nursing homes with an active outbreak also must be routinely tested until no new cases are detected for at least two weeks. Uh, you know, for so many people, they think, eh, you're tested. But I do know people that um, have to be routinely tested uh, for work. Maybe they travel or they go into um, salespeople going into other business entities. Um, they have to have a test before they go in. So uh, one person I talked to, he'd been like tested like over 72 times. And he was like, my nose is killing me. So for people such as that, I can see uh, for them saying, hey, I'm vaccinated, I don't need to get tested. Boom, they'd be on board. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be uh, welcome to not having to get tested anymore for COVID-19 if they're not in one of those specific groups that uh, is still in need for te for routine testing or for occasional randomized testing. But uh, what does stand out to me is it seems like the CDC is saying, yeah, if you're vaccinated and you're not you know, regularly going around large group of groups of people or various groups of people, you seem to be OK. But those that are going to continue to be around a lot of different people who may or may not be vaccinated or may be in at risk groups. Uh, such as older populations in, in nursing homes and long-term care facilities or those that are going to be around a lot of people in, in tight-knit quarters like you would see in a prison or in a homeless shelter in some cases. You want to still be, be cautious because not everybody there may be vaccinated and those that are and those that are vaccinated may still be able to contribute to transmitting the virus to those that are not vaccinated and continuing the spread. So still some need for testing, but not nearly as aggressive. And I think this recommendation is mostly so that they can continue to make sure that those that are potentially exposed and do not have the protection of uh, full vaccination can still be protected and in a timely manner know that they're getting COVID-19 and, and not clog up the systems at B uh, in these labs that are testing for COVID-19 if it's not necessary. Hey, uh, uh, Tyler, are you on TikTok? I am. I am on TikTok. Do you make TikToks? Occasionally. Not, 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 uh, <laughs> not, not all too often, but I do. So I guess I like I'm a TikTok troll. Okay. But I'm not, I've never actually posted anything. Um, but I will say uh, TikTok, uh, all the young kids are on TikTok. Yes. Uh, I, I do feel like we're not hearing as much about Snapchat, but from TikTok to school clinics, Michigan ramps up young teen vaccination. So with nearly a half a million 12 to 15 year old Michiganders now eligible to be immunized against COVID-19, communities across the state, uh, state rather, are ramping up efforts to help young teens get back to normal. So some schools are hosting vaccination uh, clinics as they previously did for high school students. The state is also rolling out an advertising campaign to promote the vaccine among adolescents and hospitals and local health departments are working to make vaccinations as accessible as possible to the parents of children who want them. So it's likely to be a long process though, because according to the state's COVID-19 vaccine dashboard, 30, 37,336 Michigan residents between the ages of 12 and 15 
have been vaccinated against the virus as of Tuesday, it's only about 7.5% of the state's adolescent population. So the spokesperson for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services said, the department is attempting to reach teenagers and younger populations through social media advertising, including content on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok. Several ads are also being developed that specifically focus on parents and children to encourage them to get immunized. I will say, Tyler, I hope the platform is a little bit better than the one that they had uh, earlier in the pandemic where they were like, um, oh God, what was it? it was something about don't get uh, the virus. Rona, Rona was her name. Like, right, didn't they put a name on the virus? Rona, yeah, they, hey, don't I Rona. don't want to get Rona. That yeah. was such a PR fail. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. And I feel, I think like this, that the biggest focus here, I mean, you want to get the, the kids interested in that, so to speak or thinking about getting the vaccine, but ultimately in these cases, these are minors, it's gonna come down to their parents. So you need to be able to at least spark conversations. That's gotta be the goal here. Whether or not this does that, I'm not entirely sure it's going to. It's still, it's still you know, adults talking to kids and being like, hey, you should, you should be doing this. This is the cool thing to be doing. And the kids being like, yeah, right, well, what, whatever. This, could, this is either going to be something that sparks some, some conversations here and there with parents, or it's gonna be the equivalent of Hillary Clinton's famous Pokemon go to the polls, which of course had great reception. <laughs> How do you even remember that title? Because it's so <laughs> because it's just so cheesy and dumb that it just stuck to my brain. <laughs> hey, uh, so with that, uh, I know we talked about this once before, but just to kind of remind people and kind of update you too, um, as more and more people become vaccinated, if you lose your vaccination card, what are you supposed to do? Well. Um, or even if it's been destroyed, because we know what's been happening is some people have been laminating them mm -hmm. and the heat is making the ink disappear. So there are a few things now. Uh, Michiganders can uh, contact the site where you were vaccinated. We talked about that, uh, such as the local health department or the healthcare provider request the new vaccination card. That's according again to the spokesperson for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. But we know so many people here in the area, uh, nearly 300,000 actually got vaccinated at Ford Field. Well, that's gone away. What can you do? Um, residents can also fill out a form to get a copy of their immunization record from the Michigan Care Improvement Registry, MCIR, an immunization database that documents inoculations given to Michiganders. And there's a website for that on our website, civiccentertv.com. So I will say there's some paperwork involved in that. Yeah. And it's snail mail too, by the way. Uh, but here, luckily, um, Wayne County is making it pretty easy for people and Oakland County is as well. So if you live here in Oakland County, you lose your vaccination card, the health division is able to give you your MCIR record as well as another card. That's according uh, to Bill Mullen, who is the spokesperson for the uh, Oakland County Executive Day Coulter. Anyone with questions can also call the nurse on call number 800-848-5533. Uh, again, uh, this information is on our website, civiccentertv.com. They could also make the request in person with the health division during business hours. Um, of course, the public health officials suggest residents Take a photo of your vaccination card so that you have a copy on your phone. Do not carry your original card around with you. Uh, too easy to lose, too easy uh, for it to be damaged. You don't know what happens to it. So take a photo, that should be enough. Keep it at home and safekeeping along with the, all of your vaccination cards. And the one thing we're seeing too is some people have the first vaccination um, when it comes to Pfizer and Moderna, then maybe they lose their card, they don't know what happens, then they're up against the second one. So uh, the health, de uh, health department here in Oakland County can help you with that. Yeah, and, and the big thing with this is there's no, as you said, there's no reason to be carrying that card on your person everywhere unless you're going to get that second vaccination in the case of Pfizer and Moderna because as we've had as we've had said around the state over the last several weeks and in the last couple of months really as we've been 
in this vaccination process. Vaccine passports or a system of that kind is not something that's been considered to be popped up or to be mandated in any way. And we're not really seeing many businesses that are asking for seeing these cards because they can't due to, to HIPAA, viola HIPAA rules and that would be a violation. So taking a picture of it and having it on your person digitally and keeping the physical card at home so that it doesn't get damaged and it doesn't get lost is the best thing. But in the case that you do have it lost or damaged or need another copy of it, there are solutions in place and there are steps you can take in order to get another copy of your vaccination card. As always, you can find the latest headlines. Go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus, and that's where you'll find the latest headlines. And along with that, uh, uh, direct links to some of the resources, including the Oakland County Health Department. So, um, with that, Tyler, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we really have a fun show and an informative show ahead for you uh, here on this Wednesday, right? It's Wednesday yes. hump day. <laughs> Wednesday hump day here. Uh, when we come back, I'm so excited to talk to our next guest and her mother. She's an artist and what makes her special and her art so unique. That's next here on the Megacast. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. <laughs> Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful. Because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. to have you with us here on the Megacast. Uh, as a reminder, you can always catch us live Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Uh, also, uh, Channel 15, if you have Comcast 99 on AT&T. And then if you're out driving around, you can listen to us today on 89.3 Lakes FM, um, 88.1 FM, The Biff. They are having special program today, but we'll be back with them tomorrow. And of course, you can always catch us on our Facebook page as well. So excited uh, to talk to our next guest because for so many of us, COVID-19 in the past year, it's been such a challenge. But for uh, one young girl, one young lady here in Metro Detroit, uh, she is really the shining light in the middle of the pandemic. And she does that. She brings her light and her joy through her artwork and the pandemic has not slowed her down to talk a little bit more and to bring us up to date we want to bring in zoe abrams and her mom simone great to have the two of you with us hello hi, hi zoe hi simone hi uh -huh. hi now hey uh, zoe so what's it like to be an artist how old are you by the way a b c eight old a b c it's my birthday. Happy birthday, Oh, that's so exciting. How long have you been painting? Mm. How long have you been painting? I don't know. How, what age were you when oh, you started painting? Um, I think four. I think four years old. Four years old. Zoe, some, or Zoe Abrams with us here. She's an artist. Zoe's Art 21 
<clears throat> Zoe, can I ask you, um, tell us more about your artwork. What's your favorite thing to paint? Uh, which one did you like the best? I like best is colorful. Colorful, I mean justice, justice. Justice painting? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the justice painting, what's good about the justice painting? It's kind of for a big man. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> colorful. <laughs> and she says it's a big mess. These are her own words. But, <laughs> but it, it's a beautiful piece of artwork. I saw it on your website. Uh, Simone, if we could talk to you a little bit more. You're obviously Zoe's mom. We are so happy to have the both of you on the show today. Thank you. Zoe, um, with that, uh, Simone, being Zoe's mom and trying to navigate through the pandemic over the past year, what's it been like for you? It's been very challenging, but rewarding as well, uh, because we have been in the home, in the house this entire time and trying to keep Zoe active. It's been like I said, challenging, but rewarding, because that's where I saw the burst of her painting come through, is through this pandemic. So it's the love of art and drawing. As she'll sit while, um, like after school, because she is virtual learning, but after school, she'll just sit at the computer and just illustrate, do the illustrations and drawings of different uh, clothing items or characters and things like that. And that's what she found to pass the time away. So that's why I said it was rewarding as well. That is so uh, nice to hear. And if I could ask you, Simone, too, um, Zoe's Art 21. Yeah. How did the name come about? Zoe's Art 21. The 21 represents um, a third copy of the chromosome 21. Uh, down syndrome is a genetic condition where you've got a third copy of the chromosome 21. So why not name it Zoe's Art 21? Because we're really advocating for individuals with Down syndrome and their many talents. So that's the 21 significance. And Zoe, what do you like best about painting? Okay, me, oh boy. What do you like best about what you're doing with your paint, your your art? Uh, I like colorful trees. I like funny house. So you like your colorful trees and you like the colors? Yes, I do. I like colorful. So you like colorful things. Your colors make me very happy. Really? Really? Happy? You're happy. <laughs> I'm happy too. You're happy too? Yes, yes. I'm very fine. Yes. <laughs> that, and that's what we found is that she is a happy and vibrant person no matter what at all times. And when people would see her art, they would become happy. So she she always says, she always says it makes them feel wonderful. I say, yes, sweetie. Uh, we're joined today on the Megacast, Zoe Abrams. She's an artist, Zoe's Art 21, and her mother, Simone Abrams. And uh, so I know that uh, one of the reasons that you've started an online shop is also to raise awareness about Down syndrome. Yeah. How is the message uh, during a pandemic? Is it easier to get out because so many of us are sitting at home right now? Or is it harder because you can't be out in the public? It, it, it was hard because we couldn't be out in the public, but this was doing it online. I said, you know, as we're advocating, you know, normally there are events that we can attend to advocate for Down syndrome. Um, we have a local uh, Down syndrome organization of Southeast Michigan here that we can participate with. Uh, there's different activities usually we can participate in to advocate for Down syndrome, but with the pandemic, we're unable to do that. So this online business, the first thing that you'll see when you go on her website 
is our mission, which is the advocacy for Down syndrome and individuals with the talent. So we do have up and coming uh, events this summer, later this summer, that will showcase her art and showcase Zoe. So Zoe, we'll what are your favorite colors to paint with? Uh, pink and purple. Pink and purple? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. favorite <laughs> Those are your favorite colors? You just like, you like vibrant colors? I like colorful. Just colorful things. <laughs> uh, but I see a lot of orange. It's, I know. It's mommy's favorite. That's why you <laughs> have orange is because it's mommy's favorite color. <laughs> yep. It's on her. She knows my favorite colors, so she always tries to incorporate my favorite colors in everything she does. Okay, mom, that's true love right there. Yes, it is. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Zoe, I know that a lot of your paintings are about giraffes. Yes. What yes. do you like? What do you like about giraffes? What did you do with the giraffe? Sure. Uh, I went to my family at zoo. To the zoo with your family. Uh huh. And I see giraffe. And you saw the giraffe. And I see. Him, he bit scary, he bit. <laughs> she said you fed the giraffe. What did you feed the giraffe? Leaves. Leaves and, and lettuce? Yes, that it, is. And it was scary, but it was so neat being so close, right? I was pretty shy. You were being first pretty time. shy the first time, but you came yeah. back and that's what you wanted to draw? Mm-hmm. And <laughs> paint. Oh, I got to draw and I did paint. So do you, Zoe, do you draw first and then paint? How do you come up with your creations? So, well, when you came like up, paint. when you came up with, with, uh, let's say colorful trees. Colorful trees, my favorite. What did you paint. use to paint this with? Did you use something uh, around your neck? They're called. They're colorful trees. Beads. With beads. So you picked your colors out that you wanted, right? Yeah. And then you took and you you used beads and you came up with your design, right? It makes and it. then you named it what? My best. What did you name it? Zoe. No, what did you name this one? Uh, colorful Col tree. Colorful tree. So in her eyes, her image was a colorful tree. It it I yes. It is a very colorful tree. Zoe, um, with that too, you want to be a fashion designer? Yes. Uh-huh. What, what, what kind of fashion do you want to design? Clothes. I like to clothes. Yeah? I like to design. And so do you have fashion boards? Yes. I do. So I do bars. What do you do with the fashion board? Uh, many character of what I like, and they are different clothes. Oh, so she takes the characters she likes, and she makes different clothes for them. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. So, uh, Simone, uh, we've heard so much about, uh, through the pandemic, uh, so many people are isolated right now. What has it been like for you, uh, your family, but also Zoe? How has this pandemic impacted her? Honestly, it uh, she's been very made very well aware of the pandemic through uh, the school system. She's at West Bloomfield Middle School, and they have constantly um, reinforced what you know we've been telling her about the pandemic you know, just at the at, at their level on what the pandemic means. And so she's aware of it. Um, but for us, normally our normal lives is so in, involved with therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, you know, dance classes, so much that we have taken this time to just enrich our lives at home and do the things that we enjoy doing at home. Uh, I work full time virtually, thank thankfully, my company has been supportive. And then with her being virtual, 
But this time for us, we've embraced it. We're being very careful. And um, it's been not so bad of a thing for us. That's good, though. We need to hear about that because we do know that uh, throughout this time, it has brought some families closer because you're not so busy trying to go to this meeting and that meeting and this event and that event. You get to stay home and enjoy one another. And I will say, Simone, you're so lucky to have Zoe because she is just, it's like sunshine. <laughs> yes, yes, that's how I feel every day. And every day she says, are you happy? She's like, stay happy. And that's what the expression is through her paintings. You know, her speech, she may have impairments, slight impairments, but her art is an expression and communicate the same thing. Be happy, be vibrant. Well, your colors are amazing. I love that you're so bright and vibrant. So are you working on any new artwork, Zoe? Are, do you have anything else you want? Well, I didn't think do it. She, so she works in the summer. In the summer, she has, her aunt has a business uh, and they do mosaic stones. And so we're looking forward to getting out this summer to do the more they're very heavy. Yeah, they're very heavy, aren't they? Actually, yeah. Yeah, so, but we're looking forward to the mosaic stones that she does. So uh, Zoe, too, um, what advice do you give to other people? Because you seem like you're a person, you just live life and you take on every challenge. Yeah, every challenge. Yeah. Think about. So what would you like for others to do? Uh, pizza challenge. I don't pizza challenge. It's no, a good no, thing. No. How would you like for others to feel? What? I don't get it. Sorry. No, no, that's, uh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Zoe, uh, you smile so much. Do your cheeks get tired? No. Yeah. <laughs> Fun. Right? Fun. You I like the it. smile? Yes. Yeah. What does that make other people feel when you smile? You can have fun. You're having fun. You are having fun. So how many pieces of art, are, of art do you create every week? So what do you, do you do art every week or do you, do you do art every week or do you do drawing every week? What do you do every week? I like paint. You like paint, but do you do, do you do drawings every week too? Yeah, if I can. If you can. So if she can, she, she draws and she paints. Well, Zoe, you are such a breath of fresh air. I, you know, Simone, tell us more about uh, the website. How can people find out more about Zoe's artwork? How can they order it? I know you have an online website. Yes, it's www.zoesart21.com and that's Z-O-I-E-S art21.com. So, so, and I know that a portion of this really goes uh, to support the National Down Syndrome Society. Exactly, exactly. Um, NDSS.org, uh, and there's a link to NDSS.org on her website so that people can learn more and just for more awareness and education of Down Syndrome and the support um, that they do provide us in the community. So proceeds, some proceeds will go to NDSS. With that, Simone, can I ask you, what's been the response from the community? How long has the website been up, by the way? Actually, the website has only been up for about three weeks now, but NDSS.org, and the National Down Syndrome Society out of New York, they had us on a summit. Um, they had us on a summit recently advocating for entrepreneurs with Down Syndrome. So um, since we've launched in three weeks, we've gotten, we've gotten many orders and we've gotten many accolades and um, testimonials on how they love the work. And we are excited that she will soon be in August, Gross Point, 
Arts, Beats, and Eats Festival. And in June, she'll be in the Lathrop Village uh, Arts Festival. It's so exciting. It's so great. And you know, what's going to be nice too, is being able to get out. And uh, because I do feel like Zoe is so vibrant and so happy. People need to feel her happiness. Exactly. Meet the artist. And that's what our goal is, is to meet her and see where this comes from and where all of these colors and this vibrancy originates from. And that's Zoe. Everyone she meets, I tell you, they have the same feeling. So thank you for that. Simone, are you worried about uh, selling out? <laughs> well, we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, printer in Gross Point. <laughs> and I have to put this out there, Posterity Gallery. She's, she's on it. She's like on demand. So she will have it there within 20 minutes if we need it. <laughs> so this has been a wonderful experience for us. Uh, we're talking with Zoe Abrams. She is the artist for Zoe's Art 21, Simone Abrams, Zoe's mom. The two of you have been the highlight of my week. I want to say thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and also, best of luck. And Zoe, keep painting. I will. Thank you. I will. I keep my painting. Peace. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Zoe, I like giraffes too. I went to Africa. I have giraffes all over my house. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's cute. They're, my, they're one of my favorite animals. Where is it? Where is it? She, she, said, said, where, she said giraffe is one of her favorite animals. She did? Yeah. She said more. <laughs> you like. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again, uh, the both of you taking time to be with us. We so appreciate it. Zoe, keep smiling, keep painting, and sharing your light with the community. Again, artist Zoe's Art 21, please check them out online. Buy some of Zoe's artwork, support them, and support the National Down Syndrome Society. Thank you again, uh, Zoe and Simone Abrams. Happy day to both of you. Same to you. Bye. We're going bye. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Mega Cast, and when we come back, we'll be joined by our good friend Deb Macon talking about Michigan Week. That's next here on the Mega Cast. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys. I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping, taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now there are vaccines and they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now get the facts. Learn more at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Greater West Bloomfield's news magazine show, The Splash, is back on 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. Join WWJ's Brooke Allen and the team as they cover the most interesting people, events, and projects in West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Orchard Lake, and Sylvan Lake. The Splash returns at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, May 25th on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Right now, our country feels divided, but there's a place where people are coming together. I was nervous to talk to someone so different than me. Me too. Love Has No Labels and One Small Step are helping people with different political views, beliefs, and experiences connect through conversation, and it feels good. This conversation gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope, too. Take a step toward bringing our country and your community together. Start a conversation at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development, three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization. 
to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Great to have you with us here on the Mega Guests. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios. Mr. Tyler Keith holding things down for us back there at Civic Center TV. Uh, for those that uh, maybe are just joining us for the first time, uh, just a reminder, you can always catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon live, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can also watch us Channel 15 on Comcast 99, AT&T, and listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff, and we are also live streaming today's edition of the Megacast on our Facebook page. So we try to make it easy for all of you to be able to uh, tune in to uh, some of the great interviews that we do here on the Megacast, which of course was born out of the pandemic. We're more than a year into the COVID-19 crisis. And while we are starting to get back to somewhat normal, hope is on the horizon. There are some things that we still have to do virtual, and that includes Michigan Week and the Community Awards. But the programming is going to be no less fabulous. To talk a little bit more, let's bring in Deb Megan, our good friend, with the Greater West Bloomfield Michigan Week Community Awards. Deb, thank you again for being with us. Oh my, what a treat being here, especially on the day of our big event. <laughs> So, and I love this too, because uh, we know this actually kind of started what back in the fifties as a way that, uh, who was it? The former uh, Don Weeks, he was the former state of Michigan economic development director, kind of started a Michigan week to, uh, to talk about all the great people and businesses that are here in the state of Michigan. It's evolved over time to Michigan week. Tell us more about the history. Oh my gosh, thank you. I would love to do that. So Don Weeks was part of Michigan government at that time, and everyone thought, let's shine a spotlight on Michigan, all things Michigan. So Michigan Week was born, but you know, we have always carried things to a little bit bigger way here in Greater West Bloomfield. So it literally began looking at everything and not just looking, celebrating the people, the places, the traditions, um, Michigan parks, Michigan agriculture, Michigan businesses, the faith community is involved as well. And it literally was in place for decades when leaders right here in West Bloomfield and Greater West Bloomfield decided, well, there's wonder, there are wonderful things happening here, so we need to be part of the picture. So literally, 49 years ago in 1972, leaders right here in our community decided to hold its first Michigan Week celebration in May. And it has continued to grow. And so many of us in the community have kept it alive because we are equally as passionate. So with that, Deb, I know you've been involved uh, with this program for several years, but what's it been like for you and the other committee meeting members rather over the past year? You know, we actually decided to take our own experiences and let that inform the theme that we selected for this year. Now, 2020 was the year that we'd like to put in the rear view mirror. <laughs> but clearly, one of the things we observe is that essential workers, public safety, nurses, firefighters, the neighbor next door, um, everyone around us pitched in to do a little bit more, a little bit more. And what evolved was our planning, our planning group's conversation around, look at how we're all shining together. And when someone said those words, the room erupted <laughs> and we knew that must be our theme. 
and no, with, how do you go about trying to pick the recipients? Because oh. like you said, this past year has been unusual. And I really feel it's brought us back to our community roots. Yeah. Ronnie, we're going to have to keep that phrase back to our community roots. We listen everywhere and take in whatever we hear that is a theme that we feel needs to be lifted up. And when you ask, how do we pick? Well, we have a secret. <laughs> we are, are you sharing the secret, Deb? <laughs> yes. And we have, and we're all about letting it out. We spend literally the entire year planning for celebrating the wonders of Greater West Bloomfield. And when we say the wonders, we mean who are the people that have made absolutely everything work, especially during this pandemic. So literally we are using criteria that we've established traditionally over, over decades actually. So here in Greater West Bloomfield, we honor volunteers in seven different categories and we make a spot for everyone. We really do that. Now, it's going to clearly be announced tonight. We have literally honored or will be honoring tonight close to 60 people who have done amazing things. Now, we involve everyone in the process and here's how we do that. We're very clear about the criteria in each of the seven categories from youth volunteer leadership, uh, environmental stewardship, in each of those seven categories, and there are plenty more, we literally lay out what we're looking to shine a light on. So that when someone is nominating for an award category, they have right in front of them what the expectations are. And you know what? People always rise to the occasion. It's going to be such a treat for the entire community to see the people who are shining together literally all across Greater West Bloomfield, all ages and stages of life, helping Amazing. out in many, many different ways. Deb Macon with us here on the Megacast. She's the Greater West Bloomfield Michigan Week Community Awards um, member of the committee. And with that, Deb, I have to ask, um, sure. when we're talking about so many people, it's, I, I just feel like, uh, what's been the response from them and oh, receiving oh. this? Because I've seen the um, yard signs throughout the community. You have, good, well. For 47 years, this was a face-to-face -face event, which meant, by the way, we have hosted the breakfast or the uh, volunteer gala of sorts in every venue that is large enough in Greater West Bloomfield. And by the way, we're already set for year 50 and we believe we're going to the largest venue ever because our viewership, now that we have amazingly partnered with Civic Center TV, and I am I will never stop with the accolades for what Civic Center TV has done to make this work. But you asked specifically about the response of the volunteers. Well, you know, because we've been virtual, we programmed an extra little bit of a surprise in including drama and we got our clue from the academy awards so literally once all of those 60 honorees were selected we came up with an idea we want to capture their face once they learn about the amazing way they are being honored and recognized. So the volunteer team that puts this together delivered plaques, certificates, medallions, all kinds of volunteer bling to each person's home or office so that as soon as our fabulous producer, Larry Nyland from Civic Center TV 
would introduce them on our Zoom portrait, they would have only just learned how they're being thanked. <laughs> so we capture a surprise. Now, there was another little piece, Ronnie, that you tapped into when you said, how did people respond? We delivered each tribute, each sign, each certificate. And do you know, I had the absolute most fun ever delivering the award tribute package and sign to a volunteer. In that moment, seeing the look on his face, it's this year has been worth it. It's been worth it, it touched your heart. It did, and you know what? All of my buddies, who've all become very good friends because when I say we work all year, we work all year. We want to lift up the people that are going the extra mile. And we're already in place to start two weeks after our big event tonight, literally. Already thinking ahead uh, oh. to 2022. You know what? 2022 is the 50th anniversary of the Michigan Week celebration in Greater West Bloomfield. And two of our colleagues who were part of that original celebration are with us, and we can't wait to shine a light on them. Well, That's I think it's been such a great um, platform that you've used to try to highlight all the good work that so many people here in the community, uh, how we've all pulled together. But I will say, Deb, let's hope we don't go through another pandemic again for another hundred years. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we are all with you on that. But we literally owe so much of the success for this year and last year. Again, I won't stop saying thank you to Civic Center Television and the entire crew for everything you all have done to help us say thank you in so many amazing ways. Well, I, I, again, uh, Dave Scott and uh, Tyler and Larry, they really um, are the driving force behind that. And we should let everyone know because it is virtual in a way it's kind of good because more people get to be a part of it. So the event is tonight? Yes, it is tonight. We start with a viewing party um, and tonight at 7 p.m., right here on channel 15 and over Civic Center's Facebook page and the website, people will be able to jump in and meet these amazing local heroes who are lifting us all up. And just uh, you just said it right there, Deb, a local hero since so many times we forget to thank those that are right here in our community doing so many things, just even the smallest uh, gesture of kindness can really make a difference in someone's life. But uh, Deb, again, thank you for you and but your entire team too, because I know it's been a challenging a year for all of you as well. Um, this is a huge team effort. We are very good friends. We work well together. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, we're looking for more teammates. 50-50, we expect to be in person. And to match the big ideas and big plans, we would love new friends. So with that, Deb, how can people, uh, if they want to volunteer, get involved, uh, how can they do so? I am really ready to say this. Our web presence is michiganweek.org. Won't you go to michiganweek.org, send us a note, through the contact box. <laughs> and by the way, we have that set up so that several of us will all get the message at the same time so that no message will, will um, pass us by. <laughs> That's, you know, get involved in your community. If anything, over the past year, we've all learned that. Uh, you're listening to 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake. And with that, again, uh, the... Uh, Kickoff is going to be happening tonight, May 19th, starting at 7 o'clock p.m. Civic Center TV. Every place you get the megacast, 
you will be able to watch <clears throat> and tune in to the award ceremony of this evening. Deb, anything maybe I didn't ask that you want to add? Oh my gosh, there is only one thing. Would each person who is listening, who is watching, please say thank you at least five times today, maybe more, to people who have touched your life in amazing ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, and we want to say thank you and again to you and your team as well. <clears throat> We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we are going to be joined with the executive director for the Ford Paquette Avenue plant. That's next year on the Megacast. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. <laughs> Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful. Because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In times like these, we have to believe in each other. And we believe that you'll do the right thing. When it comes to stopping the spread of COVID. Follow the three W's. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. And when it's your turn to get the vaccine, take your shot. It all comes down to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We're so close, Michigan. We can do this together. Thank you for taking time to be with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios, Mr. Tyler Keith, holding things down back there at Civic Center TV and the West Bloomfield studio. As a reminder, we're always here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 on Comcast 99 on AT&T. You can listen to us on the radio as well, 89.3 Lakes FM. Typically, we are on 88.1 FM, the BIP, but today uh, they have special programming over on their station. But again, you can also catch us on Facebook. We are live streaming today's edition of the Megacast on the show. We always have the best conversations uh, on the show and meet the most interesting people that are supporting some of the great organizations here in the Metro Detroit Avenue and or area, rather. And the next person here, David Platt, He's the executive director for the Fort Paquette Avenue plant. How cool is it for you to go into work every day? Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy every day I'm here. So it's really cool coming into the place to know it was the original factory built and owned by the Ford Motor Company and get a walk uh, the same area where Henry Ford once walked and where he helped invent the Model T. So it's very cool. <laughs> So with that, uh, David, I have to ask you, um, like, uh, you must be a car enthusiast, I'm taking. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for you, like that first day on the job, what was it like? Uh, it was very interesting because, I mean, I really got rolling as soon as it came in because we were at that time a museum that was kind of up and coming and busy. So that was the thing really even prior to the pandemic, we were on a weekend and I started on, and on a weekend getting a couple hundred people coming in here to tour, which was amazing. So, I mean, we were really busy, but it's neat because we have the only set of what they call early Ford letter cars on display anywhere in the world. So we draw visitors from around the world. And that's something I saw when I first got here instantly, not only do locals come, but also from all states and then all around the world, about almost 20% of our attendance is from international visitors. Really? Yeah. Wow, that is so fascinating uh, to me. And with that too, for uh, people who have maybe not been to the museum, mm -hmm. give us the history of the place. Okay, so 
Ford Pickett Avenue plant um, it was built in 1904. It was occupied by Ford until 1910. It was Studebaker from 1911 until the mid 1930s. But really the important historical part of Ford Pickett Avenue plant happened during the time that Ford was here. So they did make a, a Model A that was not the Model A that most people know of, but there was an original Model A and that was made on Mack Avenue, but that was just a factory that it, it was more of a garage actually and where they rented. Whereas Ford Pickett Avenue plant was the first factory that was built and owned by the Ford Motor Company. And that's the one thing about it is you get to see these cars in the place where it was built. Now, it's interesting that it was the first factory to produce more than 100 cars in a day. And a lot of people might think that would have been the Model T, but it wasn't. It was the Model N, which a lot of people have no idea about Model N. Um, but in 1906, it was the number one selling car in the United States. Um, it would probably be more famous if the Model T wouldn't have become so famous because that they built over 15 million of. Um, however, the first 12,000 were built in Paquette. Um, it would be later after Paquette, then they moved to Highland Park because they just ran out of space here. So this is a 402 foot long building, 67,000 square foot. But by the end of Ford's time here at Paquette, they were stacking cars out in the parking lot because they just couldn't move them fast enough because they had so many they're having to build in the, this is part of Milwaukee Junction. So there's two uh, train lines that intersect here. And so that's why Ford chose this location because he could negotiate the best shipping price. So he didn't have to just do what the one train uh, company wanted. And so that was very beneficial for him. But eventually he just outgrew this spot. Um, it's a mill style factory and it's, it's a beautiful piece of architecture even by itself. Now attached to us is a slightly newer construction which would date to the Studebaker era and that was an Albert Kahn building that's 110,000 square foot. So we're quite a large complex when you see us. Uh, and so with that, uh, Dave, if I can ask you, how did it uh, become a museum? Okay, so in 1999, there were some tenants in the building, including uh, General Lennon. It was owned by a family and they were actually gonna get tax credits to level the building and turn it into storage. Oh, and so that's, imagine? <laughs> yeah, and, well, and that's the thing about it is a lot of people, that's the thing with historical buildings, once you destroy them, they're gone forever. You can't, even if you try to rebuild something like that, it's never the same. Whereas this is the original building. So we're lucky that it was able to be kept. Now at that time, a lot of the windows were knocked out. There were birds in the building and everything. So the first thing is they had to secure um, that and redo some of the windows. So what it was is a group um, with, it'd be Jerry Mitchell. He was a, a Dr. Jerry Mitchell. So he was a professor at Wayne State University. He and some other concerned citizens, including Henry Ford Heritage Association, they stepped in and were able to purchase the building from the previous owner. And then at that time, they turned it into a 501c3 nonprofit on its own. And later were able to transition to a museum once they kind of started to fix it up a little bit. And they started giving tours a few years after saving the building, but then it's really been over the past 10 or 11 years where they started to get a lot more tours. And then before the pandemic, like in, in 2018, we had 31,000 visitors. In 2019, we had 32,000 visitors. It was interesting in 2020, the January and February were both record months for us right before the pandemic. So we were on track probably to hit 35 or 40,000 visitors. So now it's just trying to get transitioned back to that. It, because with that too, we should point out that you are a nonprofit. So yeah, that's right. I would anticipate well, the more visitors, the more help support the museum and uh, your efforts. Yeah, that's very true. And we're also one of the top ranked event venues in the state of Michigan. So before the pandemic, we were having a wedding here every Saturday, um, wow. usually up to 250 people. Um, we were booked out two years. So there were quite a waiting list for people to get in here. 
Um, because I will say, what an amazing backdrop, right? It, it is. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's it's a great backdrop, especially for people looking for a destination type wedding. Um, it's ideal for that. We were even ranked the number one destination wedding venue in Michigan by the Learning Channel um, in 2019. Um, and we've received a number of other rewards too. And, and that's the thing is that the, we make a lot of money or we bring in a lot of revenue from ticket sales, but also having all the events also bring in a lot of revenue and help keep the museum open. Um, and then during the pandemic, we had to transition to, for a long time, we couldn't do any events. And then we didn't have any tours either for quite some time. And then gradually we could start to do some limited tours on, you know, time tickets where we limited the number of people on a tour. Um, so for a while, there was only 10 people who could tour events. We could own, even when we started to do them, we could only do what we call a pop-up wedding where there would be 10 people at the wedding, you know, and these are people who previously had tried to book a wedding for 150, 200 people. Now they had to cut it back to 10 people. Um, so that was interesting, but we, we made it work. Um, so I will didn't... say, uh, Dave, I have to say, uh, think out about some of these brides planning these weddings. Yeah. And then it's having hard. this. <laughs> I, I'm just sorry for you and your staff, because I'm sure there were a lot of tears and a lot of yeah. frustration. <laughs> and, and I have to give a lot of credit to my staff because they did a good job on being able to transition to be able to do those smaller weddings. And then for people who didn't want to do that and still wanted to have a bigger wedding, most of them didn't cancel. What they did is they just pushed back their date. But what it has meant now too, is that going here forward, especially when we get farther into the summer, we're gonna have some weeks where we have days where we have back-to-back -back weddings. Instead of having the one wedding per week, it's double weddings. But it's just means more on the staff, but at least these couples will still be able to enjoy their day here, which is good. So with that too, uh, we're talking with David Fly. He's the executive director for the Fort Paquette Avenue plants. And with that, David, if I can ask you, the mask mandate, it's so mm -hmm. confusing yes, it right is. now. And uh, we're confused as regular citizens. Is someone in your position, how are you addressing the situation now, especially when we're talking about some of the events and the weddings? Yeah. And the thing that we've done is that we're finding that most people are still continuing to, to wear their mask. Um, I'm not going to require to see a vaccination card, but what I do is I have mask at the museum and I'll show you one of them right here. So what is, is Ford Motor Company actually donated thousands of masks to us uh, when this all started and we have them available right at the museum. Um, and when I have the tour groups together, so we still limiting the number of tours and the number of people on a tour and still using following social distancing. We're finding that most people on the tour will still have the mask. Now we do get some people that have come in and do a self-guided. And since the changes, there's been most, for the most part, they're still wearing them, but there's been a couple of people that haven't, but they kind of go on their own. So that's kind of the best way I can have been able to, to deal with it. We still provide sanitation stations throughout the museum. We do regular cleaning. We do far more cleaning now even than we did before the pandemic. Um, so I, I feel like that helps. I think the public sees that and, and respects that. And most people understand when they come in here too, it's you're in an indoor setting. So they're gonna follow that. Now there are still restrictions on the weddings too, to where we can't, we still can't do the big weddings like we would normally be doing like with the 250 people so we're doing only very small weddings still um that is something that will open up more though this summer is anticipated fingers crossed uh, with yeah. us here on the mega cast dave apply he's the executive director for the four Piquette avenue plants um so I, I will say going into summer talking about the summer we know mm -hmm. typically it brings so many car enthusiasts into right. the area, especially with the Woodward Dream Cruise. We saw a lot of these events officially closed last year, but uh, M1 Concourse has kind of stepped in to fill that gap. Sure. Do you anticipate that this is going to be a busy summer because car enthusiasts are going to come back? Yeah, I do anticipate we'll have a busy summer. And I know we actually have an event on the day of Woodward Dream Cruise Super Roll, which joins up with that. 
Um, we've actually even added some different types of events that we hadn't had in the past, including some uh, vendor fairs, art fairs, craft fairs. And so those type of events have been bringing in a large number of people who get a chance to see the museum. We include some mini tours with that. We're even gonna be bringing some um, late night tours and some ex with extended hours. And so I, I think that's another way where we're trying to appeal to those people who maybe can't fit to our regular schedule. Because right now we're, we're Thursday through Sunday. We always have a tour at noon and two. Sometimes on the weekend we have a 10 a.m. tour, but it depends on if I can get enough staff to. <laughs> Um, we used to be open on Wednesdays also, and right now we're not, but that's something that we might add back if we become more busy this summer. So it's kind of a wait and see game on that part of it. So uh, with that too, uh, you are a nonprofit and so many mm -hmm. nonprofits have been struggling because it's been hard to get uh, donations and do some of these events that sure. are big, the big fundraisers. Mm -hmm. How are you standing in that area? So what I ended up having to do was instead of doing like a big gala type fundraiser, what I've transitioned to are these art fairs and craft fairs. And we've had a couple art fairs and I run a silent auction during that. And I opened them to where they're free to the public to attend these fairs, but then just ask for a donation. And I have found that on average, most people are very generous. So for everybody, somebody who gives a dollar, there's gonna be somebody else that gives $10, you know? So in the end of the night, still it's very profitable. And then also we have a good membership. So whenever I have done limited fundraiser or do a silent auction, they've been good about participating in those. And so that's helped carry us through. I, I do like that. I will say uh, for me, when I go on some of these tours, the guided tours are mm -hmm. really where I feel like you get the flavor Yes. Of the uh, place that you're trying to uh, to visit and, and get that history. Uh, but um, you just mentioned the art fairs. I know you have some coming up. Mm -hmm. What type of artist are you looking for in what, yeah. to try to attract people? Right. And so I can tell you, we have a wide variety of artists. Um, and that's thing, I still have vendor slots available and there's still tickets available for these shows. Our next one's going to be July 11th. Actually, it's going to be on a Sunday. But it's art, including ceramics, painting, illustration, photography, sculpture, metalwork, woodwork, kind of all across the board on different types of art, which is a really cool thing because it's your chance to see art. And some of it's automotive themed, but not, not everything. So, and it's all price ranges. There's everything from extremely affordable to high end. So you'll see all kinds of different stuff when you come in here. And it's over, like for this last event, we actually had almost 40 vendors in the building. But it's, like I said, we had a 67,000 square foot building. So it's spread throughout the whole building. So it's nice. It's never crowded in any one area. It's, it's a safe experience and um, had really good positive feedback about these type of events. And, and so with that too, if I can ask you, what's it been like trying to attract some of these vendors are they eager because yeah. they've been sitting around for the past year? They want year? something to do. Yeah. And the thing is, that's like even with the number of art vendors I had this last event and it was May uh, 6th. So besides the 40 vendors that attended, I had another 30 that were on a waiting list. So that's why I even decided to do the one in July is because there was such good response to this one in May. And so some of them that then weren't able to participate in the previous one, they signed right up for the next one. So there's definitely no shortage of vendors and who wants to participate. But like I said, we still have spaces available. So if anybody wants to contact me to inquire, then glad to do that. And we do time ticketing for those vendor events, but it's also possible to come there that day if, and just make a donation at the door as well. We just try to do that to get an idea of how many people are going to attend. So with that, uh, Dave White with us here on the Megacast, Executive Director for the Ford Piquette Avenue plant in downtown Detroit. Um, where can people get tickets for some of these upcoming events? What's the general price range as well? Yeah, so the way it is on the events, like the art fair and the craft fair. Um, also, we have Model T birthday on September 26th. So all these events are free. Um, you can get a reserve a free ticket through Eventbrite. Um, you can also make a small donation uh, for a ticket or make a donation just at the door. Now for our 
pricing for museum tours, it's $15 for adults, $10 for seniors and students, $5 for youth born under or free. Hey, uh, Dave, too, before we let you go, mm -hmm. what are some of the coolest cars there? Okay, well, so to me, probably the coolest car just is the uh, Model B um, because there's only six or seven of those left in the world. The one we have is serial number one. No. So, yeah. So it's, and it's the one car you can be pretty well sure that Henry Ford probably said in that car. <laughs> it that is really so cool. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, just between you and I. Yeah. Have you sat in the car and taken a selfie? Uh, no, not that <laughs> one. <laughs> no, we do have a, we have a Model T though that is available. Um, it's a photo car where people can get pictures. And actually you'll see a lot of pictures that show up like on our Facebook and other people that will share that. Because our Facebook following now has grown to 33,000 people, which is incredible because three years ago when I started, it was 3,000. So that just wow. shows you our growth over the past few years. Yep. Well, I the anticipate model. it's going to continue to grow. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I think it will. Uh, David Flatt with us here, Executive Director for the Ford Paquette Avenue Plant Museum. Please uh, take time, go down and uh, view our history. It really mm -hmm. is history. You're so lucky to work there. Yeah, history and the architecture here is beautiful as well. So I think there's something for everybody to see. And also it's, it's a good tour for all age groups. We have a great group of docents or tour guides and they all tell a different story. So each day there's a different tour guide here. So it's even good to come back on different days. Well, we so appreciate your time and we wish you the best of luck, uh, continued success as we start to emerge from this pandemic, we hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ronnie. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be joined by Sheriff Bouchard. That's next here on the Megacast. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys. I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping. Taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two, or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now, there are vaccines. And they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now, get the facts. Learn more at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development, three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. For taking time out of your day to be with us here on the Megacast, I'm Ronnie Bell here in my home studios. Tyler Keefe holding things down for us. 
uh, back there in West Bloomfield, just as a reminder, uh, if you missed any previous episodes of Megacast, you can always find them civiccentertv.com. Just click on Megacast or you can just watch the individual interviews by going to the on-demand section. This has been um, a cough very, very tough a uh, few months and a few years, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but for so many other reasons for our local law enforcement agencies. And that includes our Oakland County Sheriff's Department. With us today, uh, Michael Bouchard, longtime sheriff here in Oakland County. Always great to have you with us, Sheriff. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. I always chat with you. Even so it, on the side of the road, like the old days. <laughs> right, like the old days. So just so people know that uh, before, when you needed an interview with the sheriff, it was always like, where are you? Where are you? Okay, let's meet in the middle. And we would literally meet <laughs> on the side of the road somewhere and uh, grab an interview. Um, but I will say to uh, National Police Week just ended uh, May 15th. It was a little bit unusual this year, of course, because of the pandemic, but I do want to extend gratitude to you as well as all the members of your team uh, for taking on the challenge to be a law enforcement officer because it, your job is more difficult today than I think it has ever been. Yeah, I, I think it's way more challenging. I've been in this a long time. Um, I actually went through the police academy in the 70s. Um, <laughs> so, we won't yeah. add up the years. You're okay. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of changes. I actually started as a police officer when I was 19. So I've seen a lot of evolution and changes and it's um, probably more difficult on the men and women on the front lines today than I've ever seen it. So many stresses are on them, societal stresses, job stress, and add in COVID and everything else that's going on. Um, and so tragically, as a result of that, we saw the last couple of years police line of duty deaths were outstripped only by police suicides. So um, last year we lost 306 police officers in the line of duty and more committed suicide. So it's terrible, terrible number, terrible pressure on the men and women. And to your point, you know, they don't feel supported by most of the politicians these days. They become demonized by them. And I think inappropriately so. And I will say, Sheriff, we could have a, a full hour long show about this, but, um, you know, I know that one time I heard Chief Craig say, if you want to be the change or, you know, if you want change, be the change, because in so many times we have people on the outside judging the men and women that are wearing the badge. And we know there are a few right. uh, that don't honor that badge, but that is not the story for so many and the majority of the officers um, that are on the front lines. And with that too, it's really hard to recruit right now. Terribly hard to recruit. And that's spot on. If you want to be involved in making something better, get involved. Don't throw you know stones from the side of the road. And you know we need men and women of character, backbone and integrity now more than ever. Um, we're having huge challenges hiring people, recruiting people. We need a diverse hiring pool uh, people of all color, of all races, uh, all ethnicities, all religions, all preferences, you name it. We, you know, we want to be reflective of the community and that's, that's a challenge to recruit anywhere, let alone in communities of color. So please consider this as an option. We would love to have you part of our team, part of the solution. And we're down about 75 people right now. Um, it's a challenging environment. And so you can make great change from being part of it on the inside. And as you said, it's a small number. You know, the, the people that wear a badge are more disgusted and disturbed by outrageous behavior of people wearing a badge than anyone else. We don't want bad apples in our profession. They ought to be held accountable. Um, but it is statistically a small number of folks that are doing that. But you see it over and over and over on the news. And I, it, it plays into the rhetoric that, gosh, this is happening all the time everywhere. Whereas in reality, if somebody, like in Minneapolis, how many times have you seen that terrible video? Terrible video, ought to be held accountable, absolutely criminal, no question on any of that. But every city in America has probably seen that video time and time and time and time again. And yet, if a police officer anywhere in America does something amazing, even uh, heroic, that's not shown in every city in America. It's probably shown in their hometown, um, maybe once, 
maybe twice, but not over and over and over. And so as a result, you get all the, the bad apples in every city shown time and time and time and time again, and all the amazing men and women very seldom shown across the country. And so that kind of fuels the perception that it's rampant and it's a majority and it's not, it's a sliver. I, I've seen the hearts of the men and women that do the job every day. You know, they don't come here for the great pay. They don't come here for the great hours because they get neither. They come because they wanna make a difference. And you know, that's that's what we ought to uphold. And, and they've been demonized, frankly. And you know, it was very frustrating and very upsetting to law enforcement in America that the United States Senate couldn't pass a resolution honoring police during police week before the candlelight vigil because they kept wanting to put qualifiers. Most police officers are honorable. Here's what they're charged to do implying that they don't do it. And I asked, I'm head of government affairs for major county sheriffs of America. And I asked a simple question, do we do that for any other profession? Did we do it on teacher week? Because we've arrested a lot of teachers for having sex with students and tiny sliver teachers are amazing. They change lives every day. Um, did we do it, you know, in, in physician week, you know, we know that over 200,000 people die in medical uh, accidents uh, every year. Do we demonize the doctors and say most doctors are, are pretty good. You know, I mean, it's all about the police focus. And it was pretty frustrating before the candlelight vigil, they couldn't even get you know, we appreciate what you guys do. You guys generically, men and women do for our society. You put it on the line for, you know, strangers and you're willing to do that, give your life and make a difference. They couldn't even say that. And it, it was pretty sad. It uh, really is. And before we jump into the conversation about qualified immunity, um, I will say uh, as a reporter, most of the people that are trying to turn in bad law enforcement officers are fellow law enforcement officers. They are the ones that maybe they can't go within the department. And, uh, you know, I will say, you know, I work for ATF and I will say there is still that brotherhood and that code of silence that does happen because some people within the profession don't feel comfortable telling, and I don't want to say telling, but exposing you know, uh, some of the people within their department or within their units because of the backlash. And it does still happen. But on the other side of that, we do know it's so many of the good law enforcement officers, they don't want the ones that are tarnishing the badge to be a part of that, uh, of that brotherhood. Right. And, and part of that's culture, you know, that has to really be pounded down into the organization that it's the right thing to do the right thing always. So if you're seeing something wrong, something inappropriate from a coworker, that's, that's something you need to engage in and report or intervene. So we actually have a duty to intervene in our policy in multiple sections that if you see something and don't do something, you are also held accountable. Um, and so we've had our people turn other people in for doing wrong and they're praised and they get, um, you know, positive comments in their personnel file. And it's, it's something that we encourage because it's the right thing to do if they see wrongdoing on behalf of another officer. So it's an evolution. I think our agency is, is leaps and bounds down that path. You know, some agencies, you know, may still have some of that blue wall, but um, it's fallen pretty dramatically, I think, in most agencies around the country because they know it, it, it hurts them in the end and they know it hurts their profession and it hurts their credibility and their connectivity to the community to allow it even in silence continue. So, you know, that's why I said we built it into our policies. You have a duty to say something, a duty to intervene. And we actually put it in our evaluations. Have you seen conduct that you believe to be inappropriate or illegal? And they sign it. So, you know, we want to do a, a kind of a periodic update and make sure that we're holding each other accountable because that's the right thing to do. So with that, I, I know that you're a supporter. Um, there is a, somewhat of an effort by some elected leaders to ban qualified immunity. Right. And tell us more about what is qualified immunity to begin with. Right. And that's a huge misnomer. I've 
been on a great deal of phone calls with members in Congress, again, as the head of government affairs for major county sheriffs of America, trying to explain it. Uh, you know, when you hear a member of Congress, you know, on some of the talk shows saying, well, police shouldn't be immune. They need to be held accountable for wrongdoing. I agree. And I agree. And the fact of the matter is they're not immune and they're not um, outside the boundaries of being held accountable. Qualified immunity is just that. It's qualified under certain circumstances. So if you're operating within the Constitution, within statutory parameters, within policy of your agency, and within clearly established principles and rights, then you get qualified immunity. If you're outside of that, you lose it. And so, you know, there's been a, like, for example, a court of appeals, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals held very clearly two police officers were outside those boundaries and they lost qualified immunity in the civil proceedings. And if you look in the Minneapolis case, that individual was convicted both criminally and the city paid out the largest police settlement in history, clearly wrongdoing, and both the city and the officer were held accountable. Um, it doesn't make bad things better it can't fix you know the tragedies that happen but it's part of the justice system to hold people accountable so that's happening today and to change that um, simply exposes a great deal of litigation to situations where it's not related to wrongdoing so for example uh, you know at one of our meetings we had a, a and this isn't just police qualified immunity is governmental so it would be police, it would be fire, it would be road service, garbage, water, you name it. So we had a, um, a township supervisor that mentioned a case where they had put up tape and signs and barricades. They were repairing a bike path that had a little bridge and a person went around all of those barriers and signs and got hurt and sued. And ultimately, even though it took tens of thousands of dollars to defend the lawsuit, ultimately it was tossed out that's where one of the touchstones of qualified immunity said, no, they, they did everything within the boundaries. They did everything correctly. And it, it, you know, you can have a tragic outcome that's not necessarily the fault of an individual officer, individual firefighter or community. And that's just, you know, the way it is. So, you know, ascribing a, the path and making it easier to sue for everything, even if you prevail in court, will eventually bankrupt communities because, you know, it hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend all the way to a verdict. And if you open up the floodgate without that filter, think of qualified immunity as a filter. If you do this, 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 and this, then you get qualified immunity. And it filters out those ones where that didn't, you know, go outside the boundaries. So um, I do remember a, a few years ago, I think there was a local reporter who did a story, um, something about police, um, yeah, it had something to do with bad cops or this, that, and the other. And so I think I had posted, hey, the invitation stands, because at that time I was still with ATF doing the recruiting and understanding what you had to go through to recruit and pass a background check. Mm -hmm. People don't understand, like going through a federal background check is not an easy thing to pass. But I remember putting it out there, you know, anyone who is willing to, you know, put on that bulletproof vest, go through the training, but also go through the background check that is needed to be hired by some of these departments, the door is open. Don't sit on the sidelines and judge, try to get on the inside and judge. And I do think um, one person who is a, a good advocate for law enforcement in the state of Michigan is uh, Representative Ryan Berman, because we do know he's a lawyer, but he was also uh, a reserve for the Sylvan Lake Police Department. So how important is it really to try to expose some of these people who are so against law enforcement to the inner sanctions of what the job is like on a day to day basis? Oh, I think it's critical. You're spot on. And, you know, we consider ourselves an open book. You know, anybody that has questions, we love to, you know, bring them in, show them our operations, show them our training. I think the two ways you get to better outcomes in these tragedies we've seen across the country, um, there's two ways to get to better outcomes, better hiring, better backgrounds, as you said, federal agencies do very in-depth screening. A lot of police agencies don't, they should. We do a very, very deep dive. So for example, the individual that uh, brutalized the African-American man in Inkster, 
Um, he actually applied to us before he got hired by Angster and we did a background went, whoa, no, he's got some problems. He had been discharged from another agency. This is not the kind of person we want to pin a sheriff's badge on. And, you know, having better backgrounds, requiring better backgrounds, screenings, and, and a host of things, you know, obviously federal agencies, they do polygraphs routinely. In the state of Michigan, we are not allowed to do pre-screening polygraphs on applicants. I took one when I was hired. We can't do them now. So I'd like to see the state law change to allow us to do that again and do other things to look deeply into a background to make sure we're getting men and women with right character and heart. And then once you have them, train them relentlessly in real world training so that they make mistakes, they make them in training and they're better equipped on the road. And yet the federal government and the state government and it, even the county government has been reluctant to pay for training facilities that do those kinds of things to make for better outcomes on the street, make for better judgments when they happen because you've practiced. It's like an NFL team. If you only played on Sunday and never practiced, it'd be a pretty messy looking game. And the same can be true in a split second real world decision for a police officer. So those are kinds of the paths I think to get to better outcomes. I wrote a white paper on it five years ago and have been trying to get Washington and Lansing to act on all those things and they haven't. And to specifically your point, having the policymakers come and actually spend time with us ride in the road, you know, on the road, I've told Congress, in any of your foreign bills, please consider requiring each member of Congress two days a year to, to ride for eight hours in the highest crime part of their district so that they understand what's going on in their own community. And they won't just see criminality or bad interactions. They'll see how many social services needs that we get called on to fill, how the mental health funding gaps from Washington and Lansing create turmoil in the streets. And we don't have a lot of options to help people. We desperately want to help. I think the mental health funding is huge and they have walked away from it for years and it ultimately ends up in our lap. That's not appropriate for the people that are having those crises. So they would learn a lot, not just about police work, but about the social service net, where the holes are and what they may want to consider as policymakers, but they don't take the time to do their homework. I can count on my hand the number of people that have visited us. I'm one of the largest police agencies in America in a county of 1.3 million people having only a handful that have actually ever gone in a patrol car or spent time in our simulator, it, it's, I think, pretty indicting that how can you make informed decisions unless you're informed? That is such a good point. I love that proposal uh, as well. And not only that, like, but for some of the activists that are on the other side, come be a part of this see what we see and experience every day. Sheriff Bouchard with us here on the Megacast for the Oakland County Sheriff's Department. Uh, quickly, uh, I know we're going into the summer months, big distracted driving effort uh, that is getting underway. Yes, yes, indeed. And one final point on that, um, not only would they see what we see, but sometimes a different set of eyes, they can say, hey, here's how we might offer suggestions of how you might do things differently or will help fund initiatives to help that kind of situation. So um, to distracted driving, yes, it's a terrible problem. We're gonna be doing all we can. Unfortunately, again, the legislature hasn't really listened to us on how some of this could be addressed. They keep trying to write very specific laws about if you have a phone, it can't be in your hand, but if it's in your hand or mounted, you can have one swipe, but not two swipes. And because some cars have Bluetooth and some cars don't. And if you're using it for directions, we don't want to disenfranchise the people that don't have a Bluetooth car. I get all of that. But the bottom line is this, it's not just a phone. So I've been telling them for years, they've now written multiple bills and passed laws trying to deal with it. And they had never had it in a situation where it's enforceable. Simply write a law that says distracted driving is any behavior where it takes the driver's focus away from their principal duty of operating the vehicle. So it's not just a cell phone. I've seen uh, women putting on mascara while they're driving down the road. I've seen a guy with a newspaper laid on the steering wheel. I saw a guy with like three different flavors of chicken McNuggets dipping him as he was driving. 
I mean, all of those things, if, if it goes to court, you can say, here's what the person was doing. They were distracted and, you know, they were moving in their lane. That's distracted driving, easily enforceable. But they keep trying to pass a law that gets into what you were doing on your phone. And we can't ever access it without a search warrant, which means we don't ever write tickets for it. So <laughs> It really is like, a, you know, it gets them a headline. But when it comes to the actuality, there is such a disconnect. Uh, Sheriff Bouchard with us here. I, we've taken up way too much of your time, but before I let you go, I just wanna ask, uh, I know that uh, you ran for governor before. If the news is true that uh, Chief James Craig is considering a run for the uh, governorship, your advice is someone who's kind of been in those shoes. What would you tell them? Um, well, you know, when I left, the political world and came back into law enforcement, I said, I wanted to be in a career where people were, had your back, not were trying to stab you in the back. So I would tell him to be wary of who's giving them uh, information, who's giving him guidance and counseling, because many people have an agenda. That's one of the toughest things for any political leader is to determine where they can get really unbiased information to make sound decisions and try to move something forward for the betterment of everybody. And I, I would tell him, find men and women of character that will give him an honest assessment and say, here's the pros, here's the cons, without filters, and now it's in your lap to make the decision and have those kind of people that are not yes people. You want people to challenge you in your decision making too. And, uh, but he's, he's you know, shown himself to be a very strong leader. So I think he's got certainly you know, an understanding of what leadership means. Sheriff Bouchard with us, always great having you with us. We so appreciate your time today. My pleasure, anytime. Take care of yourself. Stay safe out there. Thank you, ma'am. You have a great day. We're going to uh, take a quick break. When we come back, just about 15 minutes left in the show, we'll be joined by the Chief Strategy Officer for the Judson Center. That's next here on the Megacast. Greater West Bloomfield's news magazine show, The Splash, is back on 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. Join WWJ's Brooke Allen and the team as they cover the most interesting people, events, and projects in West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Orchard Lake, and Sylvan Lake. The Splash returns at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, May 25th on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful. Because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for taking time out of your day on this Wednesday to be with us here on the Megacast. Just a few minutes uh, here left in the show, but we really want to end it by talking about something that is so important. Uh, May is National Foster Care month and there are so many kids here in our metro detroit area that need foster care to join us uh, to talk a little bit more let's bring in khadijah walker fobs she's the uh, chief strategy officer for the judson center you guys do such important work over there yes thank you for having me and um, absolutely it is foster care awareness month and this is a crucial time to just highlight the need that we have for the approximately 13,000 children in Michigan who need stable homes and placements and um, really just need people to open their hearts and be willing to uh, love and support them. Um, we've seen a lot of challenges that have arisen out of this pandemic. So the need's greater than ever right now for people who are um, willing to step in and, 
and uh, support our children. So with that, Khadija, could you tell me, what are you looking for in a foster family? Yes, it's, it's really simple. Um, are you willing to open your home? Are you willing to give time? Are you willing to um, open your heart to support um, a child, a teenager, and be that, be that permanent, stable um, person that they can rely on? So anybody who is able to open their heart and, and be that person would be able to go through the process of becoming licensed. We would love to hear from you. We would love to have you. Uh, we've had over 200 children just in the last six months that we've had to place um, in foster care just through our agency. And we need homes because uh, the, the need is real and the challenges are real. And especially for our teens, we have um, so many people who um, sometimes are, are a little hesitant, you know, to uh, open their, their time and heart and a little unsure about um, our teens. But we have teens who are in foster care and they need um, support and they need stability and they need people who are willing to um, walk that walk through life with them. It's so when you talk about getting licensed, what is that process like? Yeah, so um, I'm so glad you asked. So it starts uh, with an orientation and some paperwork. And so um, if you go to judsoncenter.org, there's um, actually a frequently asked question zone. So you fill out an application, you have to do background clearances and background checks. Um, and there's actually an orientation where staff will walk you through what to expect, um, how we can be supportive to you, um, what the process is going to look like. And as quickly as a, black, a background check and the paperwork can be submitted, um, the process begins. So there's a home inspection just to make sure that uh, the home that you have is safe and will even help, help you out with meeting the need if there's things or items that are needed, such as uh, bedding, that type of thing. So uh, there's certain parameters with the state that we have to follow, but we help walk through that uh, with each person who is who's interested in becoming licensed. And so it's really not a complicated process. It takes some patience to just get through clearances and paperwork. But uh, we have staff, like I said, who are willing to stand by and help guide you through the process, um, uh, getting to that point of being licensed. And so um, it's, it's not that hard. We actually have an informational session for those who might be interested on May 22nd. It's just a virtual session. If you go to our Facebook pages, you can register. It's just a Q and A. So it just answers people's questions and lets them know what to expect once again. There's no pressure. It's just uh, getting more information on the process. So uh, can you tell me like, if someone becomes a foster parent or they sign up for the program, how long are the kids typically in their household or just does it depend? It really depends. So, you know, the goal of foster care um, and, and this is where sometimes misinformation is out there. The goal of foster care is really to reunify the child with their birth family, um, always. Now, in every situation, it's not possible. And so if that's not possible and um, the birth family's parental rights have been terminated, then that child would become available for adoption. But always the first uh, goal of foster care is keeping the child and reunifying the child back with their birth family. So that process could be 12 months. Um, it could take longer. It really depends on the, the, per, the situation that's happening with that individual family and how quickly they're moving towards the goals of whatever needs to be addressed to make that placement safe for that child. So, um, so it really does vary. Our goal is always for um, a shorter, shorter stay and that the child can go home to mom or dad or, or grandma or grandpa. Um, but, you know, that does not always happen in every case in situation, especially if there's challenges around substance abuse or some other, other barriers that are longer term. Khadija walker is with us here on the Megacast. She's the Chief Strategy Officer for the Judson Center. And when we talk about this, it seems pretty clean cut when you're looking at the paper, but really we're talking about people and emotions and Absolutely. attachments. So there could be a roller coaster ride there. Do you try to really help prepare the potential foster parents for what they could be in for? Absolutely, and you're, it's so true. It is, anytime you're dealing with people, there's nothing clean and neat about that. And so we don't ever wanna give the impression uh, that everything is neat and tidy. Um, what we do is we have support groups that meet 
every month, which I think is enormously important for anybody who's fostering and going through the process. We have trainings to help support our foster families, and we just allow them to connect with one another because every case and every child is so different. Um, some people might have a child in their home for many years. Um, some people might end up adopting a child who's been with them that they were fostering. And some people might have a child for, uh, like I said, 12 months, and then that child needs to return back to mom and dad because they've been able to get their life back on track. And so that support group is so key. Um, our staff are, are wonderful in walking through the process, um, but I do think that connecting with other people who are fostering in that moment is 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 really uh, crucial. We do have a staff person called the foster care navigator and that's something that's unique to Judson Center and that person uh, was a foster parent. They're on staff with us and they're literally there just to ask questions, kind of address crises when they come up um, and just be that support, that extra support that's needed. And so I think that that's really important. Um, that person actually facilitates our support groups as well. So I know that that's a, a nice layer of um, added support with the the challenges and the emotions that do go along with fostering. So we just have a few more minutes with you here on the Megacast. And I'm wondering too, are you anticipating so many more kids are going to be needed to be placed in foster care as we emerge out of the pandemic? Because you know, we know that uh, so many times it's the teachers that maybe are on the front lines that report some of the abuse or uh, some of their coaches. And that hasn't happened over the past year with virtual learning. Absolutely. I, I really do anticipate an uptick um, when we resume uh, more normal school schedules and sporting schedules in the fall. Um, you're absolutely right. A lot of the reporting does come out of school systems. It's when children are out in their communities, they're at camps, they're playing sports. And we, we've seen a drastic um, reduction over the last year in, in children coming into care, which would be normally a cause for celebration. And we would be saying, oh, this is amazing. But you know, we know that what's probably happening is that because children weren't in school, that reporting's not happening. I would like to think that um, you know, the abuse is not there, and not present, but I don't think that that's the reality. And so we do anticipate that as things resume, we will see um, an increase in uptake, unfortunately, of children coming into care. And so we need homes and we need people who, even if they just wanna get information on what it would take um, are willing to do that because uh, we do anticipate seeing some changes, uh, especially this fall. And so um, being prepared is key and being able to be in a position to serve the children is key. Uh, that, the thought of that just uh, breaks my heart. But with that, just about uh, 40 seconds here left with you on the mega cast. Uh, May, uh, May is National Foster Care Month. I know that you're hoping for donations. Give us more information. You're looking for your bikes and gym shoes. Absolutely. We have a whole campaign called Spring Into Action happening right now. It's on our Facebook page as well. We would love for people who are willing to donate new bikes or new tennis shoes to bring them down to Judson Center and make the arrangements through our Facebook events page. It's an opportunity to allow kids to get outside, to move, to be active. We know that this pandemic has also um, ended a lot of sports and ways that people can get out and connect in nature. And so we want kids to have that opportunity to move, be healthy, uh, burn off that energy and um, stay fit. So that's part of our foster care awareness focus. And we're hoping that people are willing to help donate. We hope so as well. Khadija walker Fobbs, Chief Strategy Officer, Johnson Center. We appreciate your time. Please support them. If you can't foster a child, please consider donating as well. That's going to wrap it up for today's edition of the Megacast. We'll be back tomorrow, 10 a.m.